last time we got together, we spoke about moda ani, which is really like the first statement a person makes when arising in the morning. We and, and we said that this is really all about, you know, whether you say moda ani in the formal sense, or at least you train yourself to wake up with this unbelievable sense of joy and gratitude that you're here for another day, that you've been gifted with another day on earth with another opportunity to serve Hashem and to, and to, you know, really fully embrace the life that he's given you. It's a consciousness shift that this is the inspiration that we can get from this prayer. And the morning prayers are divided up into sections. The section that comes after these preliminary blessings is called korbanot, or sacrificial offerings. Obviously, we are not sacrificing animals. That is not possible without the Holy Temple. And so we have a concept that being involved in the learning of the specific sacrificial procedures brings us the merit as if we had offered the sacrifices themselves. And as we'll see, prayer itself has an inherent connection to sacrificial offerings because it is a form of worshiping God that is currently on hold. And then the question becomes, so what do we do without the temple? So just to dispel, I think, a commonly understood misconception it's not that there were sacrifices and then once the temple was destroyed it was turned into prayer there was always prayer as we can see from the entire dialogue that we find in the Tanakh and there's always communication between people and God and sacrifices were accompanied by prayer by specific songs that were recited by the Levim, the Levites, and by the Ma'amadot, which are other sections uh, that are read by people of the Israel, the Israelite class, also while the sacrifice are being brought. So they are not synonymous, and one is not necessarily just a modular substitute for the other, although we are going to talk about when it is kind of like that. Okay. Prayer, as we understand it today, is rooted in the most ancient practices that we know about. When we look at um, the Talmud in Tractate Brachot, page 26b, we find the following thing. Itmar Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Hanina Omar it was stated, Rabbi Yosef ben Rabbi Hanina said the following, the prayers were instituted by the patriarchs. That is a very ancient pedigree. The Gemara over there does talk about how right, we have three prayers during the day. We have Shachrit, we have Mincha, and we have Ma'ariv, the morning, afternoon, and evening prayers. On festivals, we have additional prayers, which are called Musafim, or Musaf, that we add in for each of those days. There was a different sacrifice that was offered, and therefore there's a different prayer that happens on a specific day, whether it's Shabbat or a holiday. But essentially, the three prayers that we say during the day, according to this opinion of Rabbi Yosef or Mechanina, those were instituted by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, respectively, in that order. And the Gemara gives different proof texts as to how we see that that's the case. But then we have the other side of the, of the dispute, as it were, which is Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who said that the prayers were instituted by the rabbis to correspond to the daily tamid offerings. We have what is known as a korban tamid, um, a continual offering, which is made every morning and every afternoon. 
if that's the case, how many prayers would you expect there to be during the day? We would expect there to be only two. But we know that there are three different services that are that are performed during the day. So the third corresponds not to the actual bringing of those two korbanot, those two sacrificial offerings. Both of them, by the way, are elevation offerings, which means that they are brought on the altar and they are consumed entirely. They are not eaten or used for anything else. Those things are supposed to be consumed in their entirety. The third prayer of the day, the evening prayer, Ma'ariv or Aravit, is corresponds to the burning of the fats and limbs on the altar as opposed to the as opposed to uh, the elevation offerings that are consumed entirely. And it's something that happens and it goes through the night, which is why the timing of the evening prayer also extends through the evening. In other words, the prayers are instituted by the rabbis to correspond to the daily tamid offerings and this third one, which is the smoking or burning of fats and limbs on the altar, which is why prayers happen when they do, because the sacrifices were brought during these times, and there are specific fixed times during the day when it is acceptable to bring these offerings, i.e. to pray this specific service, and a, and a, a maximum time limit. For example, the first third of the day in halachic hours is the time period in which a person can pray the shacharit or morning prayer, and so on. So what is it? In other words, is prayer something that was instituted by the patriarchs and has nothing to do with sacrifices? We know, although we see in the book of Genesis many instances where the patriarchs or biblical personalities did offer sacrifices. Noah brought sacrifices. Nevertheless, these are not the sacrifices that are obligatory to be performed at specific times as we see in the Holy Temple. These are voluntary offerings of thanks, of gratitude, of ways to express one's appreciation for for God. So what is it? And now we have a second statement on the same page in the Gemara. Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Yechina, says to you, ultimately, I will say, in other words, the, in conclusion, the prayers were instituted by the patriarchs. It's true. But they were attached to the sacrificial offerings by the rabbis. In other words, an order was imposed. We had these three prayers, but like everything else pre-Sinai, pre the event of the giving of the Torah, there was a certain lack of form, lack of structure, totally voluntary and flexible nature to these things. Post-Sinai, these things begin to take very specific form. And once we get into the Oral Torah, the Mishnah, and the Gemara, we see that Chazal made these things fixed. In other words, Torah practice has been sort of a, if we, if we, look, at, if we look at the evolution of it as it were, I don't want to use that term too loosely, but it appears that before the giving of the Torah at Sinai, that the particular types of spiritual rectifications that are brought about by mitzvah observance in the fixed and formulaic way that we have it, as laid down by Chazal, those tikkunim, those spiritual rectifications, could have been achieved in a variety of different ways before the giving of the Torah. So we see that when Jacob happened upon this cosmic approach to animal husbandry, that he finds these, these, these various different uh, pieces of wood and he 
and he peels them and he puts them in front of the the sheep when they go to drink and it stimulates them and and then they give birth to the types of uh, the types of of sheep that uh, that he has stipulated with Lavan that he would take for himself like apparently according to the Zohar Kodosh, according to the Zohar Jacob actually fulfilled the mitzvah of tefillin in this way now how that's not something that we could possibly explain but the point is is that you had many different entry points into mitzvot before the Torah was given at Sinai. Once the Torah is given at Sinai, it takes shape. It takes form. It gets codified. It sort of gets hammered into its its final form. Okay. So we have the idea that the origin of the prayers, what we say, how we say them, what are the elements of prayer, that goes back to the patriarchs. That goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their wives, of course, as we see that they also prayed. But when it came to organizing the day, Chazal matched them up with the times of sacrificial offerings. And that's a, that's something that is, again, I, I will stress it every single time, that is something that is more of concern to Jewish people who are obligated in the strict um, structure that we find in, in, in Torah observance as we see it reflected through Chazal and the, and the Shulchan Aruch and the codes of Jewish law. That is less of a concern for B'nai Noach who have a much wider poetic license, as it were, as to how to approach these things how much of these things to incorporate in terms of what speaks to you. That's a, it's a very voluntary and very creative process for B'nai Noach. And, it, and that's a positive thing. You're not losing out this way. Note, as, as we see, that the Ritva comments here on this idea that, yes, the patriarchs did establish prayers in essence, but they were attached by the rabbis to the sacrifices. The Ritva, who was one of our Rishonim, one of our medieval authorities, says, certainly the patriarchs instituted the prayers, but their institution alone would not obligate us to say them. The fact that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everybody else in the book of Genesis prayed would not have created an obligation because things that are obligatory, at least for Jewish people, are what, what is obligatory upon us, even though you do see mitzvot given in the book of Genesis. You do see mitzvot given before the Torah is given. There are four in the book of Genesis. One is the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply. Another one is the mitzvah to, to, to circumcise oneself or one's male progeny. We also have not to eat the gid hanasheh, which is the sinew vein. We also have aver minachai, which is of, of the three things here is the one mitzvah that we know is definitely incumbent on B'nai Noach. However, the first mitzvot that are obligatory upon Jews doesn't don't happen until we get to Parshat Bo. That's this week. We have the really what becomes the first Jewish mitzvah on the Torah, which is the which is the observance of Rosh Chodesh. And then there's like a whole slew of other mitzvot that come. But the point being that everything that comes before the giving of the Torah at Sinai is, is not obligatory upon Jewish people because it was given previously. It's obligatory because of the, of the giving of the Torah. Now, in a strange way, that's also true for B'nai Noach, meaning to say that the authority that Noahites rest upon is 
also the giving of the Torah to Moshe, that they fulfill their seven mitzvot or the seven categories of mitzvot because as, as was practiced by B'nai Noach, Mishanim Kadmoniot from ancient days, because that is what has been that is what has been stated in the Torah of Moshe of Moses. Okay, so basically, everything that was once obligatory upon the entire world becomes refreshed with the giving of the Torah. So what the Ritva is saying over here is that it's true that the patriarchs instituted the prayers, but the institution by the patriarchs would not create an obligation. There's an obligation that's biblical. But but that in and of itself comes from the giving of the Torah. And the rabbis then organize them according to the order of the sacrificial offerings. So just a sense of the how this evolves into codified practice. Now, what is the concept of the sacrifice have to do with B'nai Noach. Can B'nai Noach give sacrifices? Can they bring sacrifices? What is their role? You know, what's what's their what's their place in the Holy Temple? We see a verse in Isaiah that says, For my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. And since the primary activity that takes place in the Holy Temple is the sacrificial offering, it means as well that all the peoples in this world can bring sacrifices to the Holy Temple. And we see that they do. In the verse in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, it says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took from all pure animals. In the Hebrew, it is habahima hatehora, pure animals, clean animals. Another way to understand that would be kosher animals. That which would eventually become considered by the Torah as a kosher animal, non-predatory cloven hoof chews its cud, or there are specific uh, there are specific indicators for birds and fish which have which have fins and scales. We don't offer anyway as sacrifices, but he took from all pure animals and from all pure birds. Notice fish is missing, and he raised them as burnt offerings upon the altar. So here we have clearly that B'nai Noach are allowed to bring a specific type of offering, that is to say the burnt offering, the korban ola, which is known, which is also understood to be the elevation offering. Elevation ola is the same word, meaning that we are bringing this thing up a level spiritually as an offering. It's not just an animal now, it is now a gesture that we make towards God. And Rashi adds that God commanded Noah specifically to bring these offerings seven by seven. I mean, he said, to, when, he, when, when God gives him the command to bring in the animals that are tahor, that are pure, it's not two by two. You know, all the songs that we sing to children about Noah's Ark is always about, you know, he brings in brings in all the animals two by two. But we see in the Torah text that he brings the behemot hatehorot seven by seven. Why does he do that? Because the intention was that Noah would eventually bring the animals as sacrificial offerings. Now, the Rambam says something amazing. First of all, we should know that, technically speaking, I know I'm treading on very dangerous ice right now with what I'm about to say. Jews cannot offer sacrifices in the absence of of the Holy Temple. That is not true for non-Jews. Now, let's say, let's say a, 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 um, 
an innocent Noahide says, you know what? I understand that uh, we're still allowed to offer sacrificial offerings, but I got to get somebody Jewish to help me with this. Should know it's not going to work. Why? Because we have specific laws against making any sort of sacrificial offering outside of the temple precincts. It's completely forbidden. It's called shchute chutz, and a person is liable for spiritual excision for doing so. Not only when the temple is in existence, are you are you not allowed to make sacrifices outside the temple? But even when it is not in existence, it doesn't give you any any right to to make animal sacrifice. That is something that is restricted only during the existence of the temple itself. So you can't go to your Jewish friend and say, you know what? Can you do this for me? I got a nice sharp knife here, and and here's here's Bessie. She's served me for many years, give me a lot of milk, but now I'd like to give her up to God. Doesn't work. A Jew who does that is going to be chayav. He is going to be liable for doing that, for for, for bringing a sacrificial offering. Right? But we find that, that as the Rambam says, the hanochri mutarim lakriv olot l'shem, Non-Jews are allowed to bring korbanot uh, to God, offer sacrifices to God in any place they happen to be. I wouldn't suggest this to anybody whatsoever, because people are going to think that you are involved in some voodoo ritual, and they're not going to want to be your friend anymore. Um, and and you did not hear from Rabbi Tani Burton that that non-Jews should now make animal sacrifice. We are speaking only technically. I realize that releasing this into the YouTube space, you know, definitely carries with it a tremendous amount of responsibility. However, it's not like you can just make a sacrifice anywhere in any which way. The hushi yakrivu babama shiyivnu. They have to actually bring them on an altar that they built. They have to build an, al- an altar if they're going to make animal sacrifices. And it says, Mutar lahorot lahem. How, you know, it might be forbidden for a Jew to help them make the sacrifice, but umutar lahorot lahem ulalam dam heach yakrivu l'shem akeli barachu. It is, however, permitted for a rabbi to give the step-by-step instructions as to how to do it. It's not happening, guys. It's just not happening. We are not going to have the uh, the do-it-yourself animal sacrifice workshop. Just not happening. Don't do it. Don't do it. But what does this tell you? It tells you absolutely clearly that the the idea of the sacrifice is not a concept that is restricted to Jews alone, that it is absolutely relevant to Ben Noach as well. And may there come a day when we see the temple fully rebuilt and we are able to be at, on the level spiritually where it is appropriate for us to do so. In other words, what has happened in history is that, unfortunately, as we see in the Tanakh, in the prophets, that the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, fell from their spiritual level and were no longer, they were no, they, they, they no longer possess the spiritual stature that is required for the sacrifice of animals to be a holy act. So once that has happened on a spiritual level, there is no need for a physical temple anymore because it's a completely inappropriate thing. And when we say, when we when we mourn the loss of the temple, what we're really mourning is, of course, we are mourning the loss of the temple quite literally, but we're also mourning the fact that at one point in time, we were holding on a spiritual level, on a level of 
purity and holiness where our thoughts could be directed appropriately, where our energies could be channeled appropriately, and where this becomes an act of sanctification. Right now, we are so far away from that, that uh, it would be completely unspeakable to think about doing any of these things, which is why I say to you, um, just sort of keep this in your back pocket. Now, we see a verse in the prophet Hosea. This is chapter 14, verse 3. See the following thing. It says, Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all sins and accept what is good. We will offer the prayer of our lips in place of bulls. Vinishlama farim svatenu. Very interesting verse. And it indicates that the words of our lips takes the place of sacrificial offerings. We have commentary from Rashi and Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, also one of the great commentators. Rashi says, Kach Tov, what does it mean, Kach Tov? And he says, accept what is good. We're asking Hashem to accept what is good about us. Rashi says, this means teach us the good way. Or an alternative explanation is, the few good deeds that we have in our hands, take them into your hand and judge us according to them. Look at the good parts of us. Look at our good points. Accept our good points as people, as a sacrifice, as, as if we were offering a pleasing aroma to you. Thus said King David in the Psalms, this is chapter 17, verse 2. He says, let my sentence come from before you. That's the sense of being judged by God. May your eyes behold that which is right, that which is straight and good. Please, God, see the good in me. See what's straight in me. See what's right in me. And another explanation is when, when the verse says, Kach tov, accept what is good, accept what our confession. One of the purposes of prayer is that we confess to God our sins, things that we've done wrong, ways we've messed up. How do we know that prayer involves confession? We see in Psalm 92, Tov lahodot Lashem. It is good lahodot Lashem. Lahodot has many different ways that we can interpret that word. Two of them we spoke about in our previous Shi'ur Amodani. One is to thank. Another is to acknowledge. And within acknowledgement, we have the idea of confession. When we confess, we acknowledge what we have done wrong or what we have not done right. So the fact that we have a verse that tells us, Tov lahodot Lashem, it is good to confess to God. We know that that is an inherent part of prayer as well. So here, this is what we would be doing. In other words, at least, at least Jewish people um, who had mm -hmm. sinned would bring a korban chatat, a sin offering, a korban asham, a guilt offering, or the like. The prayer of confession and the request for forgiveness is sufficient for B'nai Noach. Your ability to open your mouth and ask God to be forgiven is all you need. You don't have to go through an intermediary. There's no middleman here. You've got, you've got, you've got a straight, direct line to the CEO. You don't have to go through the mailroom. So take that to heart. That's very important. You want forgiveness? Start talking. Dial 1-800-ALMIGHTY, as Rabbi Rieti would say. 
The Radak says, Kihu imachem devarim, take words with you. What did the prophet Hosea mean? The Radak explains, I'm not asking, this is God talking, I'm not asking for your repentance, silver or gold or elevation offerings. Don't need the sacrifices. Rather, I'm asking for good words. What is what's meant over here? The Radak continues, that you should confess your sins, Vishuvu El Hashem, and return to God with all of your heart. Just be sincere about it. And if you can't be sincere about it, at least want to be sincere about it. This way you have a rung in you have like a, a link in the chain. Rabbi Nassan of Breslov said, sometimes when you don't have that feeling like you want it, when we talk about holy things, when we talk about serving God, then you should try to want to want it. And through wanting to want it, you'll come to want it. Through wanting it, you'll come to do it. Right? Wanting is very important. But here the Radak is saying, just confess your sins and do it with all your heart, and not only with your lips. Right? We all, you know, God also wants us to take concrete action to fix things and to mend our ways and to change life as we need to. O Perusho, he says, another explanation is Shitashuvu Tidvadu In other words, when you make when when you want to repent, confess. You don't have to go to a person. You don't go sit in a, in a wooden booth with a priest listening on the other side. By the way, that is not a foreign practice in Judaism. We find cases in the Gemara where a person is instructed to go to a wise and learned scholar for these things. Not that he can grant you forgiveness. He cannot. Only God can grant you forgiveness, which is why you don't go through a middleman. But tzaddikim, righteous people, can help you to figure out how to live a better life. And so we ask their advice. And part of that, part of doing that is unburdening ourselves, uh, you know, explaining what we need help with. Okay. We see in the Gemara, in the tractate Yuma, a highlight that when a person sins in private, God is appeased by words of repentance. And that's based, of course, on that verse that we just quoted in Hosea chapter 14, verse 3. And not only that, we I want to reiterate that the verse indicates that the words are accepted as if it was a sacrifice. By praising God with words... As we see in Psalm chapter 60, we will extol God's name with song and exult him with thanks. And that will please the Lord more than oxen or bulls with horns and hooves. By the way, this is not to demote the practice of offering sacrifices in the Holy Temple. That is something that we pray for every day to be able to do. But it does tell us something about how important it is to pray to God. So when we talk about the section of prayer, of the morning prayer, which is called Korbanot, what inspiration we can draw for ourselves, what B'nai Noah, what Noah can draw as inspiration, is that once you're engaging in words of prayer, words of praise, words of request, confessions and thanksgiving to God, you are already within the, the DNA of sacrifice of sacrificial offerings you're in you're 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 trafficking in the same type of exchange so it's a very precious thing that we're able to do to do that okay now we find also in the shulchan aruch which is the authoritative code of jewish law this is in the section orachim there are four sections to the shulchan aruch the first of these is called Orach Chaim, which details the daily 
laws and laws of Shabbat and the holidays. So Orachaya means basically the way of life. Okay, these are like the standard everyday things that we do, prayer, etc. We find in chapter 98, subsection 4, says the following thing, that prayer is in place of the sacrifice. That is actually a very explicit statement. I want to reiterate that it it is in place of sacrifice in the sense that we don't have sacrifices and we only have prayer. And Chazal, as we saw before, have made prayer correspond to the sacrifices. But that doesn't mean that each one doesn't have a value in and of itself. And therefore, says the Shulchan Aruch, this was written by Rabbi Yosef Karo, who also wrote the commentary on the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, the Beit Yosef. Because it is in place of the sacrifices, therefore one must be careful that it resembles the sacrifice with respect to intention, not to let another thought mix in. There are certain instances as outlined in Leviticus, where if a person had an improper intention while making the sacrifice, like he had the intention not to bring the sacrifice in its appointed time or according to its appointed procedure, that actually that thought actually invalidates the sacrifice. This is very tough for people who have OCD. I'm not talking about OCD here. Okay. But it's like, oh, wait, but did I have the right intent? Okay, Shh, relax. But the point is that be, because, because improper thoughts can invalidate a sacrifice, we have to be careful, not obsessively so, to try to maintain our focus when we pray. Not to let another thought mix in, similar to the type of unrelated thought which would nullify the sacred offerings. Okay, I need to, to make a caveat. If a person's having a problem with OCD, with this, it that has nothing to do with anything. And prayer must be recited, standing like the service in the temple. This is how we give prayer its proper respect. And in a fixed place like the sacrifices, we see that Abraham returns to his place to pray. There's an idea of makom kevua, of a fixed place where a person prays. Again, Noahides do not have to do these things, but like all other meditative practices, regularity helps focus. So it's a good idea anyway. Much like the sacrifice where each one had a fixed place for its slaughter, like where around the altar was this thing slaughtered and where the sprinkling of its blood happened. And that nothing should separate between one and the wall during prayer, similar to sacrifice where any interposition between it and the vessel would nullify it. Okay, these are technical details, but it is good if you've got a good wall Without a mirror, shouldn't be looking at yourself while you're praying, right? Just have something that allows you to focus. It's appropriate that one should have nicer garments for prayer, like the clothing of the Kohanim. The priests did have special designated clothes for their avodah, for their worship in the Holy Temple. And therefore, you know, when we're praying, we should think to ourselves, how could I, how would I arrive in the court of a king. You know, would I come in in my Crocs or would I probably put on my nicest uh, attire or at least neat, clean, respectable? Okay. It, nevertheless, it's a, right? Even if it's, it, you know, we're not talking about going to a huge expense. You don't have to wear a fur coat. You don't have to wear a tuxedo. But nevertheless, it's appropriate to have designated clothing for prayer same cleanliness, again, neatness, respectability, as they say in Yiddish, menschlichkeit. And anybody from a Germanic-speaking country knows what I'm talking about. Basically, the parallel between sacrificial offerings and prayers underscores a very deep connection between physical acts of worship 
and the heartfelt verbal communication with God that prayer is supposed to be. For Noahides, this emphasizes the permitted offerings, as it were. In other words, prayer is certainly accessible to everybody. And it and reinforces the significance of sincere words and repentance in their worship practices. So if you can incorporate prayer into your life, know that you are accomplishing that which at one point was accomplished through sacrificial offerings at the time that the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, stood. You're really plugging right back into that moment in time, which is preserved not only in the past, but also for the future. We see the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, the Mehira of Yemenu, soon in our days, we should see it. Amen.